you're in 1 Timothy 6 and 12, say amen. Now understand that Paul and what he's been through, who he's been and what, what's gone on is speaking to a younger man. Let me tell you something. If you can get yourself around, you young people, it would do you well to spend a few minutes speaking to some of the gray hairs around here. It would do you well to speak to some of the elders around here. They could teach you how to work a little bit. Mm -hmm. Teach you how to pray a little bit. I know we're quick to dismiss them because maybe we don't know how to use our phones as fast and as efficiently as you. And We grew up with cars that didn't have technology in it. And yeah. But we've come a mighty long way. So Paul, speaking to Timothy, he admonishes him, fight the good fight of faith. I guess if there's a good fight, there's a bad one. Yeah, you ever seen those folks who just can't seem to really live for God? I think that's a good example. Thank God for examples that fight the good fight. In other words, we recognize that they're going to have up and down days, have good and bad days. They're going to have days where they seem they got a little whipped and days they seem to be king of the hill. But he's, he's telling Timothy, fight that good fight. It's a fight, folks. And he says, lay hold on eternal life. That's why we're here. If you're here, you know that nobody gets out of, off of this planet alive. Nobody. They hold on eternal life, to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Anybody know you started living for God? Yeah. Make it a good one. Make it a good fight. Don't be here one day and not the other. You want to confuse the world? Can I, can I, can I, be, can I be brutally honest? One of the, the biggest reasons why people don't believe in the church anymore is because of Christians. You come here and you act one way and you go out there and act another and they're like, they're confused. Wait a minute, which is it? Fight the good fight. I want to go down to 2 Samuel and if you pay attention, you'll see the connection. 2 Samuel 23, 9 and 10 and then we'll let you be seated because what I learned yesterday, some preachers have, have a standing too long. Oh, I never want to do that. I, boy, I learned a lesson. Brother Jonathan and I finally became weary and sat down. And after him was, uh, 2 Samuel's right after 1 Samuel. <laughs> I'm here all week. <laughs> and after him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo. You can't tell me there's not some Dodos out there because there we go, there's one right there. The Ahoite. The Ahoite. One of the three mighty men with David. When they defied the Philistines, and if you've been around the Bible a little bit, you know the Philistines were the arch enemy of Israel that were gathered together to battle. And the men of Israel were gone away. Everybody ran and left this guy. Thank God for men that even if they stand alone, fight. Thank God for men that it's a personal decision that I don't care what everybody else is doing, I'm going to show up. I am going to be counted on. And he arose when a, when, 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 when a situation happened, he stood up. When a need was found, he stood up. He arose and smote the Philistines. He fought. Until his hand was weary. Listen, weary. But he didn't let go. The Bible lets us know, be not weary and well doing, for you shall reap if you faint not. And his hand clave under the sword. Something happened physically to his hand that though he was weary, he couldn't let go. 
Oh, thank God for Christians like that. Not, they're not looking for a way out. They're in this thing. Oh, no, I, it's, sitting down is not an option. Dropping my sword is not in my vocabulary. I'm locked into this thing. And because of this, even though weary, he fought on. Even though tired, he stayed in the fight. And it says, and the Lord wrought a great victory that day. Listen, though you're weary, keep fighting. God's going to use you. Though you get tired, though you face foes like crazy, stay in the fight. No. Let me check. Let me say, we don't hear about the quitters. We don't even know their name. I'll never forget uh, one of the great quarterbacks of all time. Well, not my team, so I'm not picking teams or favorites here. Joe Montana was interviewed, and they made some comments about his play. And he turned around and said, well, you remember that? And he named a name. Oh, you don't remember that guy? Well, you know that. They didn't know what he was talking about. You know why? They quit. I'm still here. Don't be quitters. The Lord wrought a great victory that day, and the people returned after him only to if you're the guy, if you're the parents, if you're the Sunday school teacher, if you're the minister, if you're, you're the church person that's willing to stand and fight when others flee, that's all right. Stand and fight, and they may trickle back in to enjoy the spoil. But rest assured, I worked and I did it as to the Lord because the Lord wrought a great victory. I was weary, but I kept coming. I was weary, but I stayed in the fight. I was weary. But you know what the sword is? The sword is your Bible. The sword is your Bible. Hold on to that word of God. Amen. Let's pray so you can be seated. Jesus, we love you. We need you. Lord, I'm flesh. I'm just flesh, God, but dust. I can't do anything without you. I pray somehow, some way to help me help somebody with your word. And everybody said, in Jesus' name, God bless you. You can be seated. I want to speak for a few moments on, hold on. Now, not the kind of hold on you tell someone you answer the phone, hold on a minute, I'm doing something. I'm talking about the holding on where you get a hold of something and you don't let go. On September the 2nd, 1987, a 15-passenger commuter flight for Eastern Express Airlines left Portland, Maine, headed for Boston, Massachusetts. The pilot and the co-pilot thought they heard a strange noise coming from the empty aircraft. The pilot, Henry Dempsey, decided to investigate. He headed towards the back of the small jet. But as he reached the doorway where he heard the sound, the plane hit an air pocket, caused turbulence, and it jolted the whole plane. The force of the turbulence threw Dempsey against the door. The door had not been closed properly. It was not latched. That sudden jarring of the airplane and the impact of Dempsey hitting the door caused the door to fly open. Pilot Harry Dempsey was instantly sucked out of the jet. Paul Brochure, the co-pilot, was immediately warned by a light indicating that the door was open. And he radioed the nearest airport, requesting permission to make an emergency landing. He reported that the pilot had fallen out of the plane and requested the Coast Guard to be notified and a helicopter to come and search the area where he could be. And the co-pilot, Paul Brochure, did an emergency landing. After the plane had come to a stop from landing, the emergency ground crews rushing to the plane made an astonishing discovery. What they found was not only remarkable, but it was almost unbelievable and inconceivable and bordered on the miraculous. To their disbelief, as they approached the aircraft, they saw the pilot, Henry Dempsey, still desperately clutching to the plane. 
he was holding on to the ladder of the aircraft. Somehow after being sucked out at 4,000 feet and 200 miles an hour, while falling, he was able to grab a hold of the ladder and the ladder support cable. Amazingly, he held on for 10 minutes, 4,000 feet and 200 miles per hour. And with the added emergency landing, the G-forces and landing at 109 miles an hour, onlookers that had seen a plane with something on the side of it had stared and watched, and they realized that there was somebody hanging on, the pilot not knowing, said that when it landed, the force of the plane landing so hard that his head came because he was face down out of the plane within six inches of the tarmac. <laughs> the interesting of note that happened with this situation is when the emergency crew got to the pilot, it took the personnel right there, the emergency personnel, several minutes to pry Dempsey's fingers and hands loose from the ladder and the cable that he was holding on to. It's pretty obvious and kind of Captain Obvious to the level of that that he was holding on with everything he had. I'm pretty sure desperate's a good word to use in realizing as you're a pilot that just got sucked out of your airplane and somehow you're able to grasp your hands around something and you're flying on the outside of your plane face down. Something in him decided, I'm going to do whatever it takes to hold on. He's going to do whatever it takes. The winds were against him. Gravity was clawing at him. Everything seemed to be against him. But he held on. When the plane turned for the emergency landing, the inertia was against him. The centrifugal forces threatened to throw him loose. But he held on. Holding on far beyond the limits of his physical capacity. When, when his strength was used up, when the adrenaline was exhausted, something in his mind simply shut down the ability to let go. Something against all odds happened in his physiology, in his mindset to, that I'm not going to let go. I, I, I can't explain it to you. It's something hidden in certain people that I don't care what's against me. I'm going to hold on. Something happened and he held on to a plane that everything known when it comes to physics and the laws of inertia that was trying to throw him off, could not displace a man that simply decided holding on. Somewhere in the back of his mind, Henry Dempsey understood through the terror and exhaustion, if I hold on, but if I let go, so somewhere in the deep recesses and the unknown places of our minds, he decided, just going to hold on. <laughs> Letting go is not an option. Releasing my grip is just not in my vocabulary. Though the excruciating pain of holding on was beyond comprehension. It was still better to endure than the certainty, of, the certainty of death if he fell by letting go. I believe that's the kind of tenacity that Paul had in mind when he tells Timothy, fight that good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, Timothy. You've got to get your 
hands on this thing. You got to get your mind wrapped around this thing. There's got to be something about you that you focus on nothing else but laying hold of eternal life because there's nothing in this world that, that is worth going to hell for it. It doesn't matter what you face, the, 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 the gravity, the the central forces, all the things that are against you. It doesn't matter what's against you. You have got to hold on. And I believe Paul's advice to Timothy is exactly what the Spirit is speaking to every saint of God in the church. Fight the good fight of faith. The devil wants you fighting one another because if you're fighting one another, you're not fighting the good fight of faith. Keep holding on. Lay hold of this thing with all your God. We are in the fight for our lives. You are in a fight for your soul. I, I, I know we like the little kumbaya songs, and you got a church on every corner that's got a neat little concert and some flashy lights and this program and that program. But the bottom line, the church is the flight school. I'm holding on. I don't care if you can sing like an angel. You better know how to hold on. I don't care if you can preach the lights out. You better know how to hold on. I've watched the best tumble and fall to the ground and lose out. I've watched those that think they really had the corner on being important. But let me tell you something. There's nothing greater than holding on and fighting the good fight. Listen, we have an adversary. We have an opponent. Hell has risen up to make war against the church. Don't, don't turn around and blame humanity about what's going on out there. They're being manipulated by unseen forces. You've got to, despite what they do, keep holding on. It's the world's turbulence. Antichrist culture and constant pull of gravity of ungodliness is tearing at the world. Collectively, it's like every one of us have been sucked out of the airplane and we're holding on for dear life. We, we feel the danger of what's going on in society. We understand what's going on with the, with the culture. And we all, all fear falling. We all fear losing out. It's as bad as it's ever been. We're Christians. We face the terror and tragedy in every arena of society, in every area of our government. There is just so much that is godly going on. We, we, I'm sorry, we can't trust them. I don't care. I don't care. Man's ways are not God's ways. And the enemy has set it up to where everything is arrayed against the church. Everything is in line, standing against the saint of God. And if that's not enough, it's like we are being threatened with a new type of pandemic or sickness or monkeypox weekly. And hell will do whatever it takes to keep you away from the church. Get you unsettled in the church. Get you sideways with the church. Get you upset with the great New Testament ark called the church. Hell knows. Because if it can get you on your own and get your own little thing going, get your own little thing, if you're isolated, it's going to be easier for hell and all its demons to grab you and rob you of eternal life. We're warned be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, you, you, don't, don't kid yourself. As a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resists steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same of afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Let me tell you something, the devil isn't running around in a red suit with a pointy tail and a pitchfork. He's hidden in the things that you really think you've got to have. He's buried himself right in the middle of the things that you love. He, he's going to put himself and immerse himself in every little thing that you've got an affection for. That roaring lion secretly hides, creeping around, seeking who he can devour. Animals know to stick together because of this. 
You know, when you think about animals, man, see, this is not the first time God has built a, a building for people to gather in. And in fact, it's so remedial, simple, that he was able to do it with animals. I'm going to build a building over here. It's called an ark. And I'm going to compel animals to get in. You know, my, my wife, being an educator, made a, let me say about something, are you smarter than a fifth grader? That's not my problem. Monkeys got on that ark. Snails got on that ark. Whatever animal you think, the chickens got on that ark. And, and you know, here's the thing. They got in the ark, and they stayed in the ark. Here they are, all mingling together with one another. And they didn't get up and leave. I don't know if that lion's uncle ate my little Impala brother over here the other day or not. But I'm not leaving this ark. Maybe I made this too simple. I can't, can't, can't see the, the, the zebras over there going, man, I'm getting out of here, man. You, you, you see that? I'll get over there and grab my Uncle Vinny the other day. I'm leaving. I don't like the fact that the elephants are right next to me. Do you see that mess I'm dealing with over here? Are you hearing me today? Are you with me today, what I'm talking about? It, it blows my mind that people that get sideways and can't even stick in the church because of a little mess and that God was able to fill an ark full of all these different species. And no matter what was going on, they weren't fussing and inviting because they knew the real enemy was on the outside. Uh, they didn't let a bunch of inconveniences and little things get them to lose out with the ark of safety. Ah, you ain't getting me out of me here, getting me out of here no matter what you say to me. I don't care if we don't like each other. I don't care if we can't. You get on that side, I'll get over here. But we both need to stay in. So if those animals can stick together in the ark, now, I am. I, I am. I'm, I'm pasting this stick. I'm saying it on purpose. I'm trying to make it, write the script and make it plain. Surely Holy Ghost filled, baptized in Jesus' name believers can hold on in a church if a bunch of animals can stick around in an ark. And the thing that they stuck on without thumbs. Sorry, just how I think. So, that was your comedic moment. It ain't gonna get no funnier than that, so. Stop thinking it's better out there than in here when a bunch of animals let you know, oh, no, it's better in the will of God than anything going on in the world. we got to face the fact that this fight's never going to end. The world will always be a hostile environment for people of faith. The world will always be the arena for struggle for the church. The world will always be the battleground of choice between the spiritual life that has been born again within you and the carnal man that seeks to destroy you. You'll never graduate from this fight. There, there's no, okay, I'm out of the fight now, trust me. No, you may be out of the fray, but you're still in the fight. Faith, by its very nature, demands a struggle on part of the believer, or it wouldn't be faith. If you're not having to use faith, if you're not having to step out, you know what, I'll, I'll, give, I'll give you some freedom. You, you, you need to maybe start stepping out in some areas just to make sure you still got it. Because the Bible says in Hebrews 11, without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder than that diligently seek him. Oh, I got a maid, I don't need to seek him. You sure you got a maid? Or maybe you've been deceived. By faith, Noah, listen, listen, there's no coincidence that he went right here to this ark that we've been talking about. Being warned of God of things not seen as yet, 
Noah did all this without ever seeing a drop of rain. Moved with fear. Isn't it funny? We're always telling God to do something, but it was Noah, but let me tell you something. You better get to moving. Forgive me, for my, but you better bust a move in the church and get on with something in here. You better grab a hold. If you, if, man, you better find something. I don't care if you're knocking doors. I don't care if you're cleaning the bathroom. I, you, it, it's no coincidence that those that were saved by the ark were the ones working on it. Prepare an ark to the saving of his house by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. There will always be an enemy contending against you. When you're living for God, there's going to be things that come against you. There will always be conflicts to confront you. The world will always be an atmosphere that is not conducive to faith. There's going to be someone at your job, someone at your school, someone in your house. There's going to be, it may be you yourself that gets in the way of your faith. So Hebrews, the faith chapter, goes on and says, what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah, of David also and Samuel and of the prophets who through faith, uh, through faith, through, through faith, subdued kingdoms, uh, wrought righteousness. Uh, in, other, in other words, listen, if you're getting pushed to the limit, on your temperament, on your attitude, keep fighting that fight. You gotta rock, you gotta do, you gotta build the righteousness, obtain promises, stop the mouths of lions, quench the violence of fire, escape the edge of the sword. Out of weakness, were made strong, wax valiant in fight, turn to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourging. Moreover, of bonds and imprisonment, they were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they're tempted, were slain of the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented. And there's a little phrase here in parenthesis. Of whom the world was not worthy. See, there are people that will walk right on out of the church to a world that's not worthy. They'll lose. Let me tell you, you cannot fight a spiritual battle with a worldly mindset. It is not going to make sense to turn the other cheek. It's not going to make sense to go the extra mile. It's not going to make sense to prefer your brother. It's not going to make sense to be a Christian. And you're going to fight for your will and your ways and what you want. So much so that you may be showing up to the building, but you're not all in here. It's about you, not him. It's about what you're building and not what God's building. Are you hearing what I'm saying? They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and in caves of the earth. All these having obtained a good report through faith. Receive not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us that they without should not be made perfect. Those without. Listen, faith demands a good fight. When you're going through hell, the song says, keep on go because faith demands a good fight don't complain don't ridicule don't look for the pro the problem with some of you is god's trying to leave you through the valley and you're fighting the whole try to get to the mountaintop no i'm trying to create something in you the fruit grows in the valley fruit don't grow on a mountaintop you want to bear fruit don't keep running from the valley don't keep running from the struggle faith demands that you ignore what your eyes see Faith demands that you ignore what human knowledge says. Faith demands that you hold on. Faith demands that you keep on holding on even when it gets tough, even when the turbulence is swirling around you. Faith demands that you lay hold of that which you cannot see. I can't imagine Dempsey thought in of any way to survive what he was going through. But second by second, minute by minute, with hands clenched, with G-forces racking against his body, holding on at 4,000 feet, at 400 miles an hour, That's holding on, folks. 
faith inspires you to believe that this world is not all there is. Faith reaches for a heavenly eternity and lays hold of things eternal. And this world will always struggle against that. Listen, there are only two eternal entities in the world today. The first is your soul. Your soul is going to live forever somewhere. And the second is the church. The church is the only institution in this world that will survive into eternity. Not a car club. Not a chiropractor's office. Not a licensed electrician. Whatever you are. No, no. You need electricians in heaven, God, so let me come up there and get on that panel. That's not going to happen. It ain't, it ain't going to matter who you were to the world. It's going to matter who you were to the creator of this world. The enemy of your soul understands something, though. If he can get you out, if he can cut you off from the church, if he can get you upset, if he can get you with a bad attitude, he can claim your soul. Old Testament had a thing, and I'm not going to preach this today, but I want to touch on it. Maybe you'll go study it. That way when I preach it the next time, you'll be running, jumping, and shouting. Had cities of refuge, places you could go if you were guilty of bloodshed. And we all are. We all are the reason he was crucified. We're all guilty of bloodshed. And so when you got to that city of refuge, it didn't matter what was going on. It didn't matter what was going on outside the city. You had to stay there until the high priest died. If you left, the slayer could get you. He had every right to you. Understand this. Spiritually speaking, if you're out of the church, the slayer has rights to you. If you're not covered by the blood, if you're not in, just like the Passover. The blood had to be on the doorpost and you had to be in the house and under the blood. And understand the devil wants your soul. Revelations tells us in 12, there, 12, 12 says, Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knoweth that he hath a short time. A short time to what? Try to get you out of the church. Try to get you to not believe in God. Isn't it crazy how far we've come? You have to understand, they, the, 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 the same decade I was born, they took prayer out of schools. You start looking at the progression is what happened. Because the politicians are trying to please the people. And now they don't want to please the people. They're pleasing themselves off our backs and our dime. I don't care, I don't care right, left, yellow, red, green. They're for themselves. There's been a, such a shift that I trust God. I don't trust a one of them. I don't care what their name is. And I'm not going to allow their little little, little things that they do that sound so good to the people. Listen, if we all just get back to serving God, the country would be just fine. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It's about your soul. I know it's hard to think about on a daily basis, but I understand everything that's going on right now because the devil has a short time and he's wreaking havoc. It's all about eternity. He's trying to get you. He's trying to get you. He's trying to get you unseated. He's trying to get you disenchanted. He's trying to get you upset at the very thing God has given you to save you. Ephesians 6 and 12 enlightens us and says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual wickedness in high places. This battle is spiritual, and the goal is the fight for eternal life. Make no mistake about it, it stays over. Lenski, a Greek scholar, says that the language that Paul uses here it goes beyond the simple context of wills or a friendly wrestling match. That's not the context here. 
specifically. He notes that the implication is that you should be straining with everything that you have. Undistracted, every effort, every thought, every muscle in your body should be engaged in this fight. The enemy wants you fighting other lesser fights because if you're involved over there, you can't focus right here. What he's noting here is every nerve ending should be screaming out in exhaustion and every part of you should be fully, completely committed despite the pain. Even when you read, if thy right hand offend thee, cut it. It's funny. The Bible is noting how desperate this fight is to remove body parts to make, and yet some of us are so enamored with the things of the world, we wouldn't let go of some of that stuff for nothing. And sadly, metaphorically, we are cutting off our nose despite our soul. So I'm saying we need to get a fresh perspective of what's really going on here. This is not a, just a passive. I'm going to show up to a little building called the church, and I'm going to waltz all into heaven because I'm a really good guy. We need to understand the battle that we're really facing today. And just any old church and any old Sunday and any old song is going to be okay. No, that's not that. This isn't a, 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 about just about the here and now. This, this isn't just a few minor liberties that are lost or gained. This is about eternity. This is about your soul. And you're quibbling and you're struggling. And your, your issues are these little things that if you could just glimpse eternity for a millisecond, you would be like, what am I thinking? What am I doing? Have I lost my ever-loved mind? And I wonder if we could catch a glimpse of what went through the mind of Mr. Dempsey as he realized it don't matter what kind of clothes he was wearing that day. It didn't matter what car was waiting for him on the drive. It did not matter anything else. I better hold on. I better hold on right now. I better hold on. Some of us better get a wake up, shake up call and realize I better get this thing a little bit more serious. I don't care about the color of the paint. I don't care about this. I better just get myself in here and hold on with all I got. The Bible lets us know everything that can be shaken will be shaken. Why is it saying that? Because it's going to find out who's holding on. Are you hearing what I'm saying? you got to understand, it's not like Dempsey can sit there. Well, let me think about this. He did not die. No distractions. No complaining. All focus was simply on holding on to that one truth. This is the one thing I cannot let go of. I can't imagine he probably just closed his eyes and gripped and forgot about everything else and locked up everything of his being on gripping whatever it is he had a hold of. Because when he found himself outside of the airplane, that's not the best place to be at 4,000 feet. Being outside of the ark of safety in this kind of tumultuous world, being out there right now, worrying about the politics and the policies, worrying about the arguing, and the, you better get your mind wrapped around it and get a hold of it. Listen, church, you got to get this. Whatever it takes, hold on. No matter the struggle, hold on. No matter what you're going through, hold on. No matter what you face, hold on. No matter what you face, no matter what life throws at you, no matter how many enemies seem to entice you, hold on. Holding on is an attitude. Holding on is a mindset. Holding on is a lifestyle. Romans it's important that Rome got this because of what was going on in their culture. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? What's he talking about there? That the real ones are holding on to the right stuff. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, as it was written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. 
We are counted as sheep of the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I, can anybody say I? I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other. You ain't getting me out of the church. You ain't getting me out of here. Shall be able to separate me from the love of God. I don't care what they're doing down the street. I don't care what they got going on on a Friday night. I don't care what they're drinking. I don't care what they're smoking. I don't care what they're saying. I'm getting in there and I'm holding on. One thing about our text is that some of the urgency might appear to get lost in the translation just a little bit. Paul is making reference to a life and death struggle. Now I know that's kind of sterile or maybe even clinical and a, a bit cliche-ish. Lay hold on eternal life. Oh, pastor. Okay, we got it. Cool, Paul. We heard you. All right. Give me something flowery to hold on to. But understand, the word he uses is much stronger than that. It, it has an additive to it in the Greek. It intensifies the force of it. It's a strong statement. And believe it or not, it's got violent connotations. You know, I, 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 I'm not saying exactly do it like the man I had in the first church that I pastored. He just realized the impact that the TV was having on him. And he left one of our Sunday morning services and he went home. And the family all jumped into the living room and all sat down and turned it on. He just got so angry. Now he was one that was there and I got no problem with the man getting rid of it but he's just so upset at himself Look, let me tell you something. If you've messed up and you really haven't lived apart and your family's suffering because of your proclivities, I don't mind you getting upset at yourself and fixing it, but I wouldn't necessarily do it the way that this brother did. He walked into his living room. He didn't bother to unplug anything from the wall. He just grabbed it. And you have to understand this is a few years ago, so it wasn't on the wall and it wasn't this then. It's one of those big old things you've got to grab like this, about pull your shoulders out of the sockets and tear your rotator cuffs. He grabbed that thing, and they had this great big, you know those houses, the great big plate glass windows in the front, the ones that we don't like, because if you turn your lights on, everybody's looking what you're doing. <laughs> he took that thing, and he threw it out the window. What he did was right. I don't recommend doing it that way, because I think grabbing it and walking it out through the front door and putting it in the garbage can achieve the same result. And a little bit cheaper. <laughs> but nevertheless, he understood. There are things that hold us captive. In fact, there's a lot of things we bring into our life that hold us captive. That occupy our hands and occupy our minds and occupy our eyes. And we get involved in the other things that we really don't hold on to what's important. So this, this, this language that he uses, it, it isn't just a casual grip. This language is the language of war. It means to hang on tightly, to get a hold of this thing with everything you have. Kind of, and this is why I'm using the Dempsey story. Hanging on to an airplane when you're on the outside of it at 4,000 feet is kind of important. I don't know that you really need to navigate that thinking for too long. And it's like if you go back and you read, and, he, and, and, and the, the, the prophets talk, how long halts you between two opinions? Look, can I tell you something? Some of you have been playing too long. You let the simple, you got, oh, you know what, you're going to have to deal with that. I'm not going into those details no more. You better work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You better understand, you better get one thing, that, you better hold on to the right thing. Hang on tightly. Paul was telling Timothy, hold nothing back. 
put everything into it he has. And long after he wants to toss in the towel and quit, like Dempsey, you just keep holding on. You just keep holding on. You have to understand something. That language is telling Timothy, son, you have to understand, Paul had invested in this young man. Paul was going to, this man was to carry on where he left off. This man was his greatest charge. He was saying, even when you're tired and even when you think you're done, you hold on some more. You take this thing so serious that you're not holding or looking at nothing else. So you got this one thing. One, It's okay to get a one-track mind if it saves your soul. Stop for just a second and imagine the, the first physical element of strain that Mr. Dempsey felt. That burning. If you've never carried or lifted anything, you may not know, but you know when you, when you, when you, when you get to the front door and you're holding about two cases of water, a case of soda, and you're able to manipulate the doorbell with a butt cheek or an elbow, and you're standing there. And your rickety old knees are just kind of shaking a little bit, and and, and you and, and you realize you're not looking cool anymore, and you're breaking out in sweat, and your glasses are slipping down on your face, and and, and, and you wet yourself just a little bit. You come to the door. You say, you know what? It's just soda pop and water. I can pick it up. It's not the end. Of, I mean, come on now, brethren, be with me. You know, when they're at the door, you better run. But when you're at the door, oh, he got it. He a man. Yeah. It's, I get it. Drop it. It's water. I remember we used to drink it out of the tap. Now we got to buy it. So here's this guy hanging on the outside of an airplane, face down. In one excerpt that I read, I think he was able to take his feet, turn his ankles to help his feet grip a hold of something behind him. He couldn't turn around and look. He's holding on for dear life. Nothing else mattered. So when that element of strain after, how much do you weigh and how, whole, how long could don't answer that, ladies. How long can you hold your weight upside down? At 400 miles an hour, at 4,000 feet, face down. I'm pretty sure at about 15 to 20 seconds, because of the adrenaline dump, the anxiety, everything in his body started screaming. Burning hit his arms, and I can't imagine the small hand muscles. Blood was pumping. The muscle fibers were straining, clenched in blind determination to not let go. And pain starts shooting through the arms, fires through his hands, fingers, tendons, and he feels now every bone straining beyond, beyond their normal capacity. And like those bottles of water in a normal capacity, I'm putting it down. But in this situation, you can't let go. You have to hold on. Church, living for God, being a believer is not a casual situation that you can just put down when it gets tough. The, oh, it's not my job, or it's not, oh, I don't have to, oh, Lord. You have to understand this is not a casual situation. This is eternity. This is ultimately surviving for my eternal soul. Slipping is not an option. Letting go is not allowed. Even, even if it costs me body parts, something locked it down in him. Hebrews 2 and 1 uses an interesting word. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard lest at any time we should let them slip. Some of us, maybe you've not fallen, but if you let some really important things slip. It's okay to do this now. You wouldn't have done it 10 years ago. You wouldn't, you wouldn't have been okay. And there's something you just kind of let them slip. The Lord's tarried in coming. There's things going on. The kids got a little older. I got a different perspective. Well, you know, just trying to be a little more. You understand something. 
when it comes to eternal life, you can't afford to slip up here. You, you can't afford to slip now. You can't let go now because what you're hanging on to is eternal life. I'm talking about something that, that transcends anything else that you think is important in your life. This is not a passive thing where you just hang on in a casual way. You're engaged in with something else. Right now, Paul said this word, world, is attacking your faith. Your circumstances are attacking your faith. Some of your worldly associations are attacking your faith. Some of the company you keep is attacking your faith. Your decisions may be attacking your faith. Your affections may be. You may have allowed yourself to get involved in some things that's attacking your faith. Some things that you've allowed into your life are attacking your faith. So Paul is telling Timothy with no uncertain terms that he needs to realize just how critical this fight really don't slip now, Timmy boy. Don't you let go of this one. There's a lot of things. There's a lot of stuff. Don't let Demas uh, sway you. Don't let the Thessalonians like uh, sway. Don't let correct. Don't let. You better hold on, Timothy. You better hold on, boy. You better hang on with everything within you because this is more than just about you. Are you hearing me, ministers? Are you hearing me, preachers? Are you hearing me? It's more than just about you. It ought to be more about just who you've been or who you were, what time. Yeah, wait a minute, this is eternal life. I'm going to take this serious. It's time we get a full revelation and understanding and holding on to true apostolic Pentecostal lifestyle. It comes a time when we got to let go of some of the things of the world and, and, the, and the little triggers of the world that the world wants to put on us. It's time for ladies to look like ladies and men ought to look like men. And we ought to be the very people that diffuses the confusion that the world trying to put on our babies. Our little 12-year-old should be running around wondering who and what they are. God made two, male and female. There ain't nothing else. There'll never be nothing else. And the reason, and the reason this confusion is allowed is because the church is waffling on standing. We are the moral compass. <laughs> and you get this Johnny come lately, he said, they're to build a, a great big building because they get a whole bunch of people that just want to be told they're okay. You're fine. Yeah, let me tell you, God does want you to have the best, but not at the cost of your soul. God does want to bless your business. He, man, he wants to bless your wallet. In the Bible, the, the term is basket. He does, Brother Jonathan, I believe God wants to bless your soft heart. I believe that. I pray that. But hold on to this thing. Hold on to this thing. God's going to get a man of God out of you. That's your wife, your daughter, people. Turn around, and one day you're going to be ministering to people just by speaking words because you held on to what matters. You hold on to this, he'll bless that. You hold on to this, he'll bless that. It ain't going to make sense. You have to understand, when it was dark in Egypt, it was light in Israel. When there was famine in the land, the children of Israel had manna. You have to understand, you got to hold on to the right thing. Don't you compromise the church for the world today. Don't you compromise the church for stuff. Don't you compromise heaven for some hobbies and habits. Hang on to this thing with everything you got because it's more than just faith as a principle. It's about more than casual Christian. This is about eternity. Whatever it takes, you got to hang on. Can, can, can I use some words? Can I I'll, I'll play some words over our Christianity right now? How many members what, what Jesus said to Peter when he told him to avoid the struggle? Get thee behind me. There comes a time when you've got to realize the struggle in and that you're holding on, that you're going to have to be aggressive. You're going to have to be aggressive about it. You're going to have to be tenacious. You're, you're going to have to quit playing and get serious. You're, you're going to have to be proactive. There, there are some associations that need to end. There are some things you've got that just because... They, 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 oh, they're not unlawful, but the problem is they're not expedient. 
Some of you are stuck waffling. You're stuck in the, the, in the in meandering in the area of not expedient. You're not doing nothing. You're not achieving nothing. And therefore, when it comes to the church, you don't mean anything. Lay aside every weight and the sin. There are some things that have crept in over time in the church. Some things that have been allowed to rise up. Even things that take place in your heart. You need to get those things out and you need to get yourself back under the blood. They're undermining your faith and you can't afford to lose your grip on eternity now. Don't let eternity slip from your grasp because you're holding on to the things of this world. Revelation 3 and 11 says, Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast what you have. Let no man take thy crown. It means, hold fast, use strength. Seize a hold of it. Literally hold and lay hold and retain and take power and take it by force. Listen to me, your goal, the goal of the enemy, of your soul, we know he's come to kill, steal, and destroy, is to rob you of the crown and steal your chance of eternal life. What is your purpose? What is your goal? Hold fast to eternal life. This isn't Paul speaking in Revelation. This isn't Paul. This isn't Peter. In Revelation, this is Jesus. He said, I come quickly. But until that day arrives, let me warn you. Jesus said, let me warn you. You better hold fast to the things of God. You better hold fast to eternal life. You better hold on. to. Don't let anybody rob you of your crown. Don't let the devil trick you. Don't let the things of this world just cloud your vision. Don't, don't let anything. You've got to be like Dempsey. And you better get a grip of whatever it is that you got to get God and, and say, you know what? I'm not going to let go. I'm not going to think about nothing. I'm not going to look at nothing. I'm laying hold on eternal life and I'm not letting it go. Y'all know the story. Jacob held on. You know, after that whole situation and returning home from Laban's house and that terrifying night where he knew that he's going to have to deal with his brother Esau. Esau's already been spotted and he's on his way. He sent everybody away. It's funny, when you get in a fix, the Bible is just full of people that knew how to put the important things important. Now is not the time to get involved in more of the world. It's time to start shedding it's time for, you know what, as for me and my house, we're going to get a one-track mind. It ain't going to make sense to our neighbors. It's not going to make sense. Those teachers ain't going to understand. That politicians don't care. It's just, you know what, I, for me and my, we're going to make sure we got blood in our house. We're going to have the things of God going on in our house. The Bible says he sent away everyone and spent the night alone. It would do some of us good to get alone and have a good old-fashioned prayer meet and allow God to speak directly to you. Let me help you. Pray, 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 then shut up and let him speak. Be willing to say, not my will, but thy will. Let me hear what you really, if you haven't heard from God in a while, you got a mandate in the word. It is time for you to get serious with God. Has a little prayer meeting with God. And suddenly the door of his life flew open. And he was sucked out into the turmoil of a spiritual fight for his life. The next thing you know, suddenly there's a man there who confronted him. It's just a stranger that had come to rob him. Regardless, it was a fight like he'd never been in before. You were worried about Esau, huh? This fight lasted all night. They were rolling and they were wrestling and they were sweating and they were getting dirty, rolling around in the dirt. They were getting tired, but there was something about Jacob and he struggled all night and long into the early morning. But somewhere, somewhere, 
suddenly along the way, he, he, he realized this was more than just a human struggle. It was a wrestling match with the angel of the Lord. It was decisions being made. Trajectories were being determined. And eventually, the angel commanded because he did. I don't know how he wrestled with people before. Maybe he's wrestled with you and you let go. Maybe that time when you wouldn't get in prayer, it was the angel there going, Mark, you just let go. How many of us have lost and let go of things we could have had because we just wouldn't hold on? And here he is face to face with an angel. And the angel finally has to say, let me go. Okay, you ever get a hold of God where God said, okay, I got you. Let me go. Oh, when's the last time you saw God? You want to get up and speak to the church, and you want to get up and sing to the church, and you want to get up and dictate to the church. Let me ask you this. When's the last time you stayed up all night to make sure you got a hold of God? Be careful who you're listening to out there. They sound good. They sound flowery. They say a lot of wonderful things that send chill bumps and tell you how good you're going to do on the job. But you better hear from someone that will stay up all night and make sure they heard from the mouth of God. And all of a sudden, the angel, the Lord says, let me go. The day is breaking. They had wrestled throughout the long night hours. And I'm sure the sunlight was getting close to appearing. It had been a long, grueling night. The angel was giving Jacob a chance to give up. How many of us have taken the out? How many of us, well, okay, maybe it's not for me and we've let go. But what makes Jacob stand out in the example that we get? And the Bible lets us know these are examples for us. Maybe there's somebody here today. Maybe it's a young person. Maybe it's a, a mother. Maybe it's maybe someone that, that you're about to be handed an opportunity. Because Jacob held on. The strain of that long night was urging him to let go on. I'm sure his muscle, I, I can't even imagine. The weariness was telling him to let go of the strains and the, the muscles of his hands and his fingers. The weariness was probably telling him to let go. Everything in his physiology was saying to let go. But he kept holding on. The scrapes, the bruises from the battle, from the fight. Oh, oh, I'm pretty sure everything in his body screamed to give up and let go. But what separates out the Jacobs from others is he held on. Why? Why do some people hold on and others let go? Can I tell you? Because somewhere deep in his spirit, Jacob understood there's something more going on here. There's something more at stake here than just the wrestling match and the strain of my body and the strain of my mind. There's an angelic opportunity that's been presented to every one of us. Something is about to change. Something might break. If I hold on, something different can transpire in my life. I've been letting go my whole life. I've been taking the easy path. I've been doing what looked good to the world. But this night, this time, I'm going to hold on. Something in the spirit saying, if I let go now, I'm never going to receive everything that God intends for me to have. Do you, do, do you really want to let go and miss out on a supernatural opportunity from God? I like his answer. I ain't letting go. I ain't letting go except you bless me. What an attitude. I can't imagine how refreshing that was for God. Now, most of you know I lost my dad as a teenager. The weekend prior to losing my dad, we went to the lake. And I'm just a dumb 16-year-old kid. And I'm wrestling with my dad in the water. I hadn't gotten the stories yet of why my dad was afraid of water, but he never told us. I got a hold of my dad not knowing this. <laughs> I 
I had the advantage. See, my parents were, my dad was so worried. Listen to this. My dad had such a fear of water. I have memories that go back that I'm so little that the kids next to me that I see were just barely out of diapers. They wanted us to learn to swim at a young age because my dad had a fear. I learned to swim. I, I was so, it was so young that I have vague memories of it. But at age 11, and I'm not bragging, I'm just telling you how much we swam. Well, there was also no, you see, a day at the swimming pool was cheaper than a babysitter then too. <laughs> they was thinking. But at age 11, I became certified lifeguard. Now, I wasn't physically able to pull some of you jokers out of the water at that age. You know what I'm saying, Aaron? I was kind of little like you. But I could do all the other things. I knew how to swim. I grabbed a hold of my dad in that Lake Berryessa, and I'm wrestling with him, and I look, oh, I'm getting kind of an advantage here. I'm like, wow. When you start to get one over on dad, it, there's something about your ignorant nature. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm dunking dad. I got him. I got that inner tube out from under him, and I was, man, I've done a little bit of martial arts. with I was like, yeah, I got that. I looked up at the bank to get cheers from everybody on there, and my mom gave me a look. That my, I should have turned the stone. Medusa had me. <laughs> I realized, whoops. You need to let my dad drown me because I don't want to face my mom. And when I let go of my dad, he had he was so happy. <laughs> and I learned something there. Some things you better let go of. <laughs> I go gingerly to the shore, and my mother, being British, gave me the what for. I felt about this big, and I learned something about my dad. But listen. Jacob decided, I'm not letting you go. I finally got my hands on something supernatural. I finally broke through to that place in God. You see, the reason some of you have got so many things going on is because you don't have anything this big in your life yet. Paul, Paul said, I am apprehended of something I'm trying to, oh my God, it's got me, but I'm trying to get it. And if you would have that moment today, if you would realize what Jacob and what this, this Mr. Dempsey shows us, and even after the angel touched him, even after the angel wounded him, you're going to get wounded in the house of God, but don't let go. You're going to get hurt in the house of God. You may walk in a limp around. The angel touched him, and he was going to limp the rest of his life, but you know what he did? Some of you let go because you got that limp. You see, when you're blessed of God, even a limp is worth it. Because the whole thing about coming in contact with God is you will walk different the rest of your life. If you come in contact with Jesus and it hasn't changed your life diametrically, you need to allow him to touch you to change the way you walk, what you love, what you. And until that happens, you're always going to be predominantly you. Jacob knew that without holding on until the blessing came, the entire wrestling match would have been for nothing. His life was going to be defined by what he did at this moment. If he let go now, he's just going to carry the limp as his only remembrance of this struggle. Listen, there won't be some scars. There are going to be some things that you'll be able to look back on and know you let go of it. There's going to be some repercussions for the fight. There are going to be some lasting ramifications. There are going to be some separations that are going to have to happen in your life uh, if you hang on. If you hang on, some changes are going to take place, but you got to hang on. Some things will never be the same of those people that hang on. I, I'll never forget it. When, the conversation's always the same. When you talk to a youth group and their, their young preacher shows up that came out of the youth group, he got a hold of something we didn't. No, no, no. He, he, he just decided to let go. Believing in God and walking with God are two different things. 
Believing God and walking with God are two different things. Jacob was determined to get more from this fight than just a limp. Jacob wanted more than just to walk different for the rest of the He was determined that if I'm going to walk with a limp into this future, it was going to be a future that was blessed by God. Bless me, he cried. I held on when others let go. Tenacity in his spirit. I'm not going to allow anything. I'm not going to allow alcohol. I'm not going to allow drugs. I'm not going to allow cigarettes. I'm not going to allow this world. I'm not going to allow this stuff. I'm not going to allow prestige. I'm not going to allow people to slap me on the back. He had the tenacity in the same spirit that gripped Henry Dempsey. If I hold on, I live. And if I let go, I die. Throughout scripture, God has always tested to see who will really hold on. Who is all in? Who is prone to let go? And who is prone to hold on? That's what it's like. At 80 plus years of life, can you like was still holding on. He had another spirit in him. I'm telling you, give me my, at 80, give me my, oh, give me some of that. Those three Hebrew boys uh, being told to bow, but they held on to their upbringing. That, 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 that lonely prayer warrior facing down a den of lions, I'm going to keep on praying. That ruddy young shepherd boy showing up with a slingshot. Those precious 120 souls that showed up in the upper room held on. Stephen as a stone. Folks that hold on when others are. I'm talking about people that are holding on to the things of God. Their hands are full of things of God. They don't have time for nothing else. Let's stand. Listen, listen, listen. You can't get what they did and not do what they done. Folks, it's time some of us got a hold of what mattered. I'm talking about people that refuse to let go. You even tell me the church is going to be open and I'm going to be there. Individuals have that tenacious spirit to hold on and seek the face and the purpose of God above all. While others walk away, they're walking on. Jude chapter 1. Play it softly. I won't finish. But beloved, remember you the words which were spoken before of the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, how they were told, you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. He's not talking about the world. He's talking about people in the church. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the spirit. They ain't got it. They're around it, but they don't have it. They just can't stay the course. All it takes is a text or a phone call. All it takes is an incident. All it takes is someone not shaking their hand or not being included or being told, hold on a minute. But ye, and I, I pray that's everyone in this room. Beloved, some of you are building the wrong things. Building up yourselves on your most holy faith. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Keep, oh hallelujah, yourselves in the love of God. Keep yourself. It's up to us to keep holding on. It's up to us. It's up to me to hold on to the right. It's not up to me to try to find, oh, that I'm juggling. I want my hand in the nail scar talking about those that hold on looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life it's plain speaking right here and some have compassion making a difference this is my meager attempt right now to make a difference that I might be able to get someone to let go of what's kept you from holding on to Jesus Maybe you've been around here a long time. Maybe this is your first time, but I promise you, if you'll get a hold of the things of God, this world will grow strangely 
them. And others saved with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by them. How many of us have got that spotted garment on because we just won't let go? And present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and evermore. You see, this isn't just something that happens in heaven. It needs to be, you need to let go of the world now. Your treasure needs to be heaven now. Those that hold on to the right things now. We often preach. Now, I, I want to give this to you as a favor, as a commercial, as, as just a little thought from pastor. We always talk about Jacob holding on to God. Listen to me. Let, me. let me say this. He was also holding on to Jacob. God could have ended that wrestling match. Don't you get this wrong. Anytime he wanted to, he could have shut that thing down. Anytime he wants to. But that, but I just really feel this is for the church. God could have ended that wrestling match, just like you could end striving. The Bible says he won't always strive. But if you feel his presence right now, he's holding on to you. It's time for us to keep holding on right on back. It's time for us to lay aside. It's, it's time to get a hold of God like never before and don't let go. God is the master of the wind, the maker of the storm, and he is with you right in the middle of your crisis. Whatever you face right now, he is there. This is the promise. And as long as you're determined to hold on to him, he's going to hold on to you. Yes. Listen, Jacob, Jacob cannot win that wrestling match by himself. God had to hold on to him even as he was holding on to God. I just believe that in the middle of everything that's going on around us, everything that we face, all the things that, that vie for our attention, God sent me to tell someone today, if you will hold on, if you will get a hold, if you will lay hold of Jesus, He'll be the one holding on to you. The one you're clinging to in the midst of the tempest of your life right now. With all the trouble you're surrounded by. With all the turmoil that is spinning around you in your world. The one you're holding on to right now. He's holding on to you. John 10 says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone pluck them out of my hand. You can't get me out of this grip. You, I'm holding on and you can't get me out of this grip. Understand the spirit of this world. The enemy of your soul. Wants you to give up. Wants you to let go of Jesus. It's not the first time in John chapter 6, Jesus put out some hard sayings. And when you're going to be an apostolic Pentecostal, there's going to be some things that are going to seem hard because you've been raised by the world. Some of the holiness and separation and some of that just seems kind of like it can be awkward but understand Jesus said from that that time it says many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him then said Jesus to the 12 will you also go away will you let go you're hanging at 4,000 feet at 200 miles an hour are you going to let go and Simon answered him and said Lord to whom shall we go Thou hast the words of eternity. What's he saying? Hold on, folks. Hold on, folks. You see, the world, the word lets us know that we're going to be hated because of our walk with God. Understand? There is so much disdain for the church right now. But he that endureth, that holds on to the end, shall be saved. 
Are you hearing what I'm saying? 